Galatians chapter 6 this morning. In just a moment, we'll take some input from you, be thinking of some spiritual disciplines, some, maybe we could call them strategies, that would encourage biblical change. We're working through our study of sanctification with the book You Can Change by Tim Chester. This morning, we're looking at chapter 8 with this question, what strategies will reinforce a life of faith and repentance? So what can we be doing in the course of a week that would foster that heart of turning from sin to God and uh, turning to faith in God? So we're turning from wrong desires to a desire to honor the Lord. We're turning from the lies to the truth. So repentance and faith, what strategies, what obedience to biblical command, what spiritual disciplines would foster that spirit of repentance and faith. So you'd be thinking of spiritual disciplines, and in a few moments we'll uh, hear from you. So we're thinking through biblical change. And Lord willing, this week, uh, starting today on Sunday and going through next weekend, Lord willing, there would be some spiritual change. We would increase in wisdom, which is the application of truth to obedient living. Uh, we would increase in our understanding of God's character. We would increase in uh, our uh, pursuit of holiness, of Christ-likeness. Because we can come week to week and continue talking about change, but if we never decide, that's a great idea, I need to do that, I want to do that, then uh, this becomes a bit of a futile effort. Uh, obviously, it's easier said than done to just say, I will change, and yet there, there's something to be said about standing firmly on the authority of Scripture and saying, I can and I will change. Remember, that's God's plan. He said, I'm going to conform you to the image of my son, so it's perfectly right for us to say, I will change. I'm going to change. I'm going to do this. That kind of resolve is merely an echo of God's stated purpose to make us like Christ. In this chapter, we're trying to figure out what strategies need to be implemented in the course of a week to continue to allow that repenting heart to flourish, that believing heart to flourish. And before he even gets to some strategies that unfold in the chapter, he, he wants to answer the question first and foremost with our text in Galatians chapter 6. We read there, beginning in verse 7, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. These aren't unfamiliar verses. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up or if we do not faint. What is the doing good? Well, it can obviously be all kinds of good works. But when we're reading it together with the previous verse, it seems like the good would at least begin with the one who sows to the Spirit and then reaps from the Spirit that eternal life. That sowing to the Spirit is the command. And then we're told, don't grow weary in that doing of good, that sowing to the Spirit. Not always easy, and so we need to be admonished to not faint, not give up, not throw in the towel, not like a runner saying, oh, I'm so, I, oh my lungs hurt, my legs hurt, I've got a cramp in my side, I just want to stop. Don't give up. Don't grow weary in that doing of good, in resisting the flesh and sowing instead to the Spirit. Because of all the rain, you probably didn't notice it a whole lot, but to get up here to 
the top of Bly Road, you pretty much have to pass some kind of crop in a field. Uh, if you're coming in Bunshu, you're, you're seeing some corn over there, some corn and beans coming from the south. Well, everything you saw growing there was the result of sowing, of planting that took place weeks or months ago. Everything there is, is on purpose. That, that's merely the result of the work that was done before. And your spiritual life of this past week, with its perhaps scheduled Bible reading, with an intentional neglect of something else in order to pray, with reigning in anger in that moment and choosing a soft answer instead, or the opposite of all that, the chaos, the sin failures, the, the need to confess. and for Whatever the spiritual condition of the past week was, and you can look back and know how you succeeded or failed, that was not just some kind of random happening. That was the harvest. You reaped in this past week, in your spiritual walk, what had been sowed or planted for weeks and months before. So Tim Chester is arguing in this chapter that this life of repentance and faith needs to be fostered. It needs to be supported by strategies or spiritual disciplines, though he, he kind of doesn't want to use that terminology, he says, because he he's feels like for some people that becomes just another achievement, another box to check, and you can do all those things and still not have a heart of repentance and faith. But however we look at it, I think we're helped by understanding this principle of sowing to the Spirit, realizing that what you see in your spiritual life today is the result of what you've sown in the Spirit, what you've put into your heart in the past weeks. In other words, sanctification, it's success, we could say. It's progress. Sanctification is a harvest. It's not just some miraculous work that happens to us. Uh, it's a harvest. It's the hard work of, of planting and cultivating, and then we reap the harvest of holiness. We sow to the Spirit, and we reap from that Spirit all the fruit of new life in Christ. In the life of the believer, we have to recognize from the previous chapter, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. There's a lot of conflict there. There's a lot of against these things are working against each other. They are seeking to thwart the other. The flesh is trying to discourage the restraint of the spirit and say, go for it. And yet the spirit is trying to thwart that enticement into fulfilling the lusts of the flesh uh, by calling us to holiness, by showing us Christ. And yet one of those natures is going to kind of gobble up our time and our resources and our energy and our thinking. And essentially it's not even just that passive being gobbled up. It's the fact that we're taking our time and our resources and our energy and we're sowing either to the flesh or to the spirit. We're intentionally carving out a place and putting the seed in the soil. And then it seems as if a lot of times in our Christian life, we're, we're surprised by a really bad week of spiritual living. And we forget that we've been sowing for days or for weeks. We've been sowing reckless abandon of reading the scripture. We've, we've, been, we've been sowing busyness that really crowded out prayer. We've been sowing and now we're reaping. And the author just wants us to take a step back and look at sanctification. And if we're wringing our hands thinking, boy, I'm just not changing, he's saying, well, what have you been sowing? Why isn't there a harvest of holiness based on this text? The author calls us to avoid, then, whatever is provoking sinful desires 
has a couple paragraphs here in this chapter that are going to make us think a little bit. Um, he's going to remind us change must come from the inside out. It must be heart change. We must get to the root. However, he's saying you're going to be greatly helped uh, by not putting yourself in a position of constantly having to fight massive battles with temptation. Okay, so the emphasis is the heart has to be the place of change. However, we would do well to regulate the amount of influence and the kind of influence that's bombarding us. So he says, while change must be from the inside out, avoiding temptation is a part of the solution. Not that you can avoid all temptation. But he references a couple of passages in 1 Corinthians, and I think it makes it clear that there's, there's something about proximity to temptation uh, that should cause us to have a pretty quick response. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 18, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, flee from sexual morality, immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Flee from sexual immorality. It's as if Paul was asking them to remember the, the ancient story of Joseph in Potiphar's house, being tempted day by day, it says, and he kept on refusing. And then one day, it says, everything worked out perfectly. There's no one in the house. All the circumstances would make it really easy to sin. And yet Joseph literally runs from the temptation. There, there's something there that makes us think, you know what, don't spend a lot of time in the face of temptation trying to think about your plan and, and what am I going to do and this is so hard. It might be as simple as the first step is just get out of there. Buy yourself a little bit of space to do some spiritual thinking and warfare in the mind. Flee from sexual immorality. It's just, it's one of these texts that, while you could go elsewhere and find biblical logic for fighting against immorality and how it's the love of self versus the worship of God, in this moment, it's not think through all the, the reckonings of spiritual wisdom, uh, revisit the Proverbs and, and weigh out the adulterous woman. No, he just says, run, just run, get out of there. And with that little bit of distance, find some space there to do some serious thinking. Flee from sexual immorality. Again, in 1 Corinthians 10, a familiar text dealing with temptation, there is no temptation that is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but will with the temptation also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, if that's true, that God's made a way of escape, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I don't picture somebody taking time to look at those little schematic drawings of that floor or your building like a fire escape, you know, and so here's temptation. God's made a way of escape. I don't think the way of escape is, you know, trying to find, okay, here you are, go down this hallway, these stairs, out that door. No, no. I think it's really easy. You turn and run. The, the crash bar is always the opposite direction of sin, and there's the door. I don't think the way of escape is real hard to find, according to 1 Corinthians 13. It says there's a way of escape, therefore flee. In other words, just get away, and you found the way of escape. So this text is not like a puzzle or a maze, and you might find your way away from sin, and temptation, if you know the right course, no, the right course is turn and run. And that will be the way of escape. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Again, avoiding temptation and not being in the place of temptation will not make you holy because sin and temptation can come from within. Your own mind can provide enough temptation. 
The change has to come from inside. However, we shouldn't put ourselves in a place of being bombarded by sin constantly. He goes on to say, whatever strengthens sinful desires should be avoided. He argues those sinful desires are obviously going to be fed by our culture. And culture in the Bible is usually a word uh, in the New Testament, the word world. Things like love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. What does that mean? You know, don't love the geography of your home. Don't love your nation. No, the world as, as a system of operation, which is generally anti-God. Don't love the culture, the world, the, uh, the existence of humanity in that state of ruin and sin. Don't love the world. That's 1 John chapter 2, or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It can't be both ways. You can't live for the world and say you're living as a Christian. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, this stuff is not of the Father, but it's, that's what sums up the world. So are we listening to the voice of the world? Are we being bombarded by the influence of the world? At times, we, we try to regulate that bombardment. So we might say, well, I'm not going to watch this movie. It just has, you know, too much in it, too many words, too many scenes. Um, you know, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to avoid this or that. And, and we have ways of trying to curtail that influence from assaulting us. But the fact of the matter is, we're being bombarded. And we may not know just how much. Psalm 1 reminds us of the blessings that come when we reject worldliness and intentionally choose to find a place of less attack. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. He chooses not to be in a place of continual attack. Now, this doesn't mean you can quit your job and and somehow find perfect saints to work among. I, I have a job that keeps me with very few people, and yet that very person I'm with can cause enough problems. Me. Um, so you can't isolate yourself, but the idea is don't, don't make your comfortable existence always in the place that's kind of on the edge, and it always is forcing you into hard uh, choices, dealing with strong temptations. Rather, let your delight be in the law of the Lord. In his law, meditate day and night. Be like that tree planted by the rivers of water. That's constantly bringing forth fruit. Um, study that passage in Psalm 1. So here we have this thought the author is presenting, and I think we can see its virtue. 1 John 2, don't love the world or anything in the world. Psalm 1, don't be among the worldly. Let's, let's talk out a little bit uh, an objection that could be raised. What about Jesus' prayer in John 17 that tells us that he's not taking us out of the world, but he's leaving us in the world? So what do we do with that text? Jesus saying, I'm not taking you out. I'm leaving you in the world and yet later we're seeing, oh man, I'm not supposed to love the world and the stuff in it. So are we supposed to get out of the world to eliminate temptation? Or as Jesus prayed, are we kind of stuck in the world? How do, how do, we, how do we reconcile these ideas? Get away from the world because of its bombarding influence? But Jesus saying, I'm leaving you in the world. What do you think? Yeah. I was always taught that to be in the world, but not of the world. Okay. In the world, but not of the world. That's taken from John 17 there. I'm not taking you out of the world. I'm leaving you in the world. What else? Or expand on that? Go ahead and look at the purpose that Christ is leaving us in the world for, which is the 
further his kingdom, not to become part of the world and the world's kingdom. Right, so now we have purpose that explains being in the world, um, part of his kingdom advance. What else is in John 17 that gives us a little bit of an answer? Um, yeah, so in 17, uh, 15, I do not ask that you take him out of the world, but that you keep him from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them in the same manner into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Um, one, it's, I think it's important to see that there's a parallelism to how Christ is acting in the world and how we're compelled to act in the world, thinking of him being in the culture but not of the culture, um, immersed and surrounded by the people of the age, but not influenced by the people of the age. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot more that could be said there, but that's kind of what comes to mind. And then also, I guess, the two there is that the sanctification sanctification is a core part of this being in the world, <clears throat> excuse me, being in the world, but not of the world. Yeah, when you read that John 17, it brought Dave's idea in of, of purpose as Christ came into the world. So he's sending his disciples. There is this purposeful commission. And yet he knows they will be bombarded by the world's influence. And yet he gives us this, this key, which we had already heard from the psalmist in Psalm 119. Uh, how does a young man keep his way clean? By taking heed to the word. Jesus is now saying, sanctify them by the word. Psalm 1, don't be among the worldly, but delight in the word. Uh, so now we're finding that this, the, the need for God's word to keep and to sanctify and to cleanse, to help us change, becomes all important. It's fundamental to our change process. Um, Roy, and then we'll go to the back. Do you have something you wanted to add there, Roy? I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> Probably won't want me to add it. You know, I, some of this sounds very familiar to my past, which I have great angst with much of what was taught there. And fleeing fornication is obviously a direct command. But fleeing everything doesn't work because most of my problem is not the situation. It resides behind my shirt pocket. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. God doesn't tempt anybody. We are tempted by our own heart. And I can flee, but my heart goes with me. And I look back at that passage where you started, so to the, so the, uh, to the Spirit, and, and you did go back to the first, but so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. I think the sowing of the Spirit is a life walking with and leaning on the Spirit. And, and it's probably a whole lot more than that, but... Man, the way we started thinking goes right back to the isolationist past, past that I lived in where we huddled as many times as we could a week with other believers and then we'd wrap a track on a rock and throw it at people. We were not engaged and yet Jesus was accused of being a friend of tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. There's got to be some balance here somewhere. Hey Adam, I got some thoughts, but I'll let you. Yeah. So, no, we're, we're completely on the same page in, in saying you can't just change the exterior and think that'll change the heart. Uh, he gives some examples and made up names, of course. Jack struggles with lust, so he stops watching TV and filters his internet. Carla struggles with desire to be loved by people, so she stops flirtatious actions with Co-workers, stops reading romantic fiction. Uh, Colin wants to be in control, so he stops micromanaging and planning everything out in a day. Emma finds refuge in materialism, so she stops browsing and only shops with a list of needs. You can go on and on through people's efforts to try to curb 
behavior by limiting some kind of temptation. And we would probably say, if the heart is right, these are steps of wisdom. On the contrary, if somebody says, oh, I'm so tired of, you know, looking at pornography, I just can't, I can't seem to get victory over it, and I blah. And yet, you know, they stay up late every night, and they're always on the computer, and there's no filter, and it's like we would say, really? You're really saying you want to be done with this, but you don't want to do anything that would look like radical amputation. So it, there, there's, there's two ways we have to come at this, and certainly we cannot fall into the ditch of saying, well, just, just structure life so that you never you know, are tempted to sin, because you're right, that won't work. It, it comes from the heart. But on the other side, if the heart is, is really serious about change, then we sit there at the feet of Jesus and hear, you know, radically amputate these things, deal with this, flee. And we do, like Joseph, we flee, we get out of there. Um, so there's the, once we've eliminated kind of the, the wrong view that you can just change the outside, just put a few accountability things in place and you'll be great. No, um, you, you could isolate yourself in a monastery and you're still going to have your sinful heart with you. But if your heart is, is grasping how change happens biblically, then you'll gladly hear, I need to avoid you know, these influences that I can voluntarily avoid. Um, you can't avoid the world, um, even voluntarily, because that would violate Jesus' plan for you uh, to be in the world and to live and to work and to shop with ungodly people and their influence. But he says... I will sanctify you by my truth. I'm not going to sanctify you by your years of experience that you've logged as a Christian. That's not enough. Uh, that's why pastors fall. Because years of experience just don't mean anything. What means something is being in the Word every day. And you say, well, every day, well, okay, I'm, I'm kind of weary of being accused of being a legalist by saying things like every day, but what else is there? What else is there? Does this day not matter in spiritual warfare? So we have to start reckoning with, do I want to change? And if so, will I do everything the Bible says that is to my advantage to be a better Christian by the end of this day, let alone the end of this week, if God gives it to us? So reckon with this idea of influence and ask yourself, how much worldly influence do I tolerate or do I think I'm immune to uh, without realizing what, how it's kind of seeping in, how it's undermining uh, my sanctification? Uh, so we need to be saying no to sinful desires. We need to be saying no to, to the ongoing influence. If it can be avoided, we need to be saying yes to uh, the word. And Roy was right, when you're in that Galatians text, you get back to that sowing in the spirit and you won't gratify the lusts of the flesh. And it's another text that reminds us that the greater desire will help you fight the lesser desire. If you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe there's no room for the flesh, so you don't make provision for it. Uh, maybe when you're Investing in the spirit, you don't have anything left to give to the desires of the flesh. Uh, someone had a hand up. Marlene, was that you back there? And then we'll come to Jared. I was wondering with uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the way of escape that God provides. Do we have not an excuse then? If God provides a way of escape. We have no excuse for our sin. So he's wondering also about um, the indwelling Holy Spirit gives us power over the temptation. And he provides that way of escape. So um, I guess I'm saying without that change, like you were saying, in the heart and the spirit dwelling in you, without Christ we can do nothing. Right, John 15, you know, if we're not abiding in the vine, we have no strength. We can't do anything. 
And Marlene's right. This text is, is really simplifying things for us. Uh, there's the reality of temptation. Um, there's the reality of some level of your ability to resist. And so the war is on. There, there's the conflict. James 1, you're being drawn away. There's the reality of temptation. But the word of contrast is God is faithful and with the temptation will provide the way of escape so that you can endure it. Conclusion, flee. Because you can, because of God's faithfulness and way of escape, you have to flee. Um, God is sanctifying. God is keeping his promise. God is providing a way of escape. You have to flee. You have to want the pleasure of God, the smile of God, the worship of God, more than you want the pleasure of sin. Um, and that text just kind of keeps us from rambling into any excuses or talking in, in many words. We kind of compromise our real efforts at sanctification. Uh, just keep it simple. I'm tempted. God's faithful to provide a way of escape. He honors his word, John 17. He'll sanctify us by his word. I can flee. I can flee. Uh, Jared, how are you going to help shed some light on all this? <laughs> well, if we start back in Genesis, God created. He created man to till the land. He created beauty. He created skill. Um, so all those things God created, they aren't evil in themselves. Uh, and it says he walked near with God. And then when sin entered, the relationship with God was broken. We weren't near God anymore. And things, and where sin comes in is when we make them bigger, when we're controlled by them, when they're bigger than God is to us. Because even we see skilled labor, he got skilled labor to build the temple, things like that. And so now in today, or after sin, we see that we must uh, feed the heart what we feed the hearts of where our heart is going to be. So whether it's sinful things, then that's what's going to draw us near towards. Or if we draw near to God, if we feed that side of our heart, we're going to draw near to Him and we're going to have those desires. We're going to be controlled by those desires. Whereas sin controls the heart. Um, so in that victory, we can't, it's not that those things that we're tempted generally by are evil. It's that they're misused, they're misplaced. You know, sex, God created that. But the world, sin, misuses it. And so in feeding the heart, what are we feeding it? It's not that we're feed, necessarily feeding it wrong things. Are we feeding it things that glorify God, that draw us nearer to God? And that is where the power in the New Testament is displayed, that that's where the power and victory is over sin and keeping that balance. Yes, the danger is we can, we can make idols out of things that would be considered good things, uh, even good gifts of God. Um, it, it, it all comes back to that struggle of desire. Uh, what is that desire that's being fed? And the author says this. Uh, let me know what you think. He says, when you say no to sinful desires, you'll feel loss, grief, and anger as you starve the flesh. What do you think of that? Or something else. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just actually going to bring that up earlier. Is like, it's not a fun thing to put down the desires of the flesh. You know, like your natural state, like it's painful. You know, like I think <clears throat> there's a verse in John that stuck out to me where Jesus talks about how he's the true vine, and then the bad branches are thrown into a fiery pit, and the good branches are pruned to produce fruit. And then, like <clears throat> the way it was worded. In scripture, just kind of like maybe re like think about that as like that's not a like being pruned. That's not a fun thing, you know. So um, I think that's one thing to keep in mind and have kind of settled in your mind before going into each day where it's like, yeah, it's gonna it's, you're not gonna be able to participate with the world or do things like the world does, and it's it can cause some. I don't want to say pain. I think pain sometimes, but just like, man, I wish I could do that, or I wish I could just say whatever and things like that. But um, the end result of, like you said, making God smile is what we want most and what we should strive for. 
but knowing that it's not going to be like this happy-go-lucky, like, oh, that was easy kind of thing, you know? Yeah, if it were easy, we probably wouldn't need to be talking about it so much. Um, but think through your own struggles with sin and recognize how strong that desire is. Consider how well-crafted the, the enemy's attack is to make you want that, to, to miss it when it's gone, uh, to crave it uh, after you're trying to walk away. Um, it's just not unlike, you know, you're trying to cut some carbs out or something, and you just love having your noodles and, you know, bread for a spaghetti dinner. Uh, you just don't want to give it up. Um, I think we have to recognize that the Bible is going to use language of killing the flesh, of cutting it off, uh, radically amputating. We're going to have to understand this isn't always going to be as easy as, oh, yeah, I'll do better this week. No, it's a war. It's a war. Just thinking about kind of paraphrasing John Owen, that, which I'm slowly reading through right now, but... Uh, this idea that starving the flesh doesn't feed the soul um, is prominent in a lot of his writing, which is that we can go through great lengths to starve the sinful affections and do nothing to actually strengthen the soul or the spirit um, towards, towards Christ, which he would elaborate, he, John Owen would elaborate, that that's why so many of these passages throughout the New Testament have this parallelism, right. that it's not starve the flesh or starve your desires and live a great Christian life. No, it's, that's, it's stop drinking from the poisonous well of sin and begin feasting at the table that is Christ. Um, I've been helped by that and just uh, myriads of, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know why I can't talk today. Um, been helped by that in a lot of different ways, just evaluating my own life and thinking about how many times that I exercise discipline with no desire to actually feast. Again, John Owen speaks to that too. It says that many of you are not actually mortifying the flesh. You're just simply boring. Um, to use a more modern terminology, is that you're not righteous, that you're not actually pursuing the nature and work of Christ. It's just simply that you are moral because you have, by peer pressure or a desire to please or some sort of superior moral good in your own heart, are living a life that is laying aside various deeds, but there is very little affection for Christ himself. Um, there's a lot there, but just this nutshell idea of starving the flesh doesn't feed the soul. Um, and you can see that there's kind of two calls there um, that both need to be fulfilled, not just the one. Right. It, it's, it's all through the scripture where you can't just say, don't do the bad, don't do the bad, don't do the bad. Um, it starts at salvation. You know, we're told uh, Jesus teaching, he says, you know, one cleans out the demon in the house and gets, okay, we're done with the bad, only to have you know, sevenfold return because it's an empty space that needs something. It needs direction. It needs to be filled with something else. So in Ephesians 4, the whole put off the old man with all of his deeds, that's great, but what else? That, that naturally comes with and put on the new man, which is made after Christ in righteousness and true holiness. Uh, here in Galatians 6, it's not just don't sow to the flesh, don't sow to the flesh, and somehow that means you're on the right path. It's don't sow to the flesh, but instead sow to the Spirit and reap there. Uh, so over and over again, you'll find uh, what Paul was referencing in Owen's writing, that just starving the flesh isn't equal to a thriving Christian life and harvesting sanctification. No, don't sow there but do so over here. Uh, we have to be doing something, sowing to the Spirit, strengthening uh, those spiritual desires by fanning the flame and cultivating that love for God, cultivating the obedience to God. Um, 
back to even what Roy was saying with his original uh, concern there that we, we just can't deal with the bad. We need something more than that. Um, and again, it's, it's Thanksgiving dinner, cooking, and it's only an hour away. So what keeps me from snacking on Pringles chips and eating Skittles? Well, it, it's because I know a greater desire awaits. That's what I'm really wanting. I'm going to save room for that. Um, there's the putting off because of a putting on. Um, so what are some reinforcements of um, this spirit-filled life? What are some, we could call them, spiritual disciplines that, that put us in a place of allowing the heart to kind of blossom? Um, it'd be like taking a house plant that says full sun and you've got it you know, in the hallway um, and you realize, you know, if I just moved that out here to the porch, it gets some sun, and, and now that thing thrives. Uh, what are some ways that we can help our hearts in steering the right desires into action? So what are some spiritual disciplines? To prime the pump, we've already talked about the Word, John 17. Uh, we are sanctified by the Word. Uh, that word reveals our hearts to us. It then reveals the heart of Christ, and it shows us how to bridge that gap. Um, so we need to be in the scriptures, remembering that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Sanctification happens by the word. So dig into it. Uh, we need the Bible, some kind of regular influence by the very word God has breathed out. Um, so there's a starting place. We need to be people of the word. It's dwelling richly in us. It's taking residence there. It's unpacking and it's here to stay. What else? What else will foster a life of repentance and faith. What else helps us say no to the flesh, yes to the spirit? What are some of the other spiritual disciplines that could round out a life uh, pleasing to the Lord? Yeah. Well, in Ephesians 6, it says, you know, to be strong in the Lord, fire gives light, but also to put on his armor. So putting on the armor of God, thinking through Ephesians 6. All right, what else? David? Prayer. <clears throat> right, prayer. Ephesians 6 ends with having now all the armor on, praying always. <laughs> um, and so prayer uh, kind of becomes the, the natural outflow of a heart that says, I want to engage in the warfare, dressed in the armor of the Lord, uh, all that armor finds its fullest protection and productivity in a spirit of prayer. J.C. Ryle said, Prayer and sinning will never live together in the same heart. Prayer will consume sin or sin will choke out prayer. So prayer fosters the heart of repentance and faith. At least it's going to bring to light what needs to change. So, scripture reading, prayer and warfare. I would, I would challenge that last book because you have to start somewhere, and where you are is probably battling sin. And that feels like a defeatist attitude. I'm going to dig in and pray, and oh, here's the sin again. You know, this is an ongoing battle. And, and we make it a dichotomy where somehow they've got to exist in the same place. Your goal, obviously, is to drive out the sin. But I've, you know, I've set myself uh, two hours a day aside being on the resort to pray, and I've done that for two weeks, and I'm still battling the same thing. Oh, well. No, it's, a, it's an ongoing fight. You're going to have to do both. But I don't think he's saying if you pray, you won't sin. He's saying, if you're praying, you know, sin can't exist when you come to the Lord 
uh, seeking him in prayer. Sure, but that's a turning from the sin to the Lord. He's, just, he's basing this on Proverbs. If I regard iniquity or Psalms in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So sin, right, so sin and prayer cannot coexist. That's biblical no matter how we unpack it, whether our own thoughts or, or riles. Uh, if I'm saying I want sin, then I can't be going through any of these disciplines. And he makes that point. You could do all these things in some kind of rote exercise of the Christian life, and it really doesn't produce heart change. Um, and maybe you've been there. You, you got through your Bible reading that year, but it didn't seem to be the sanctifying influence that it was promised. But where was your heart in that Bible reading? Right, I think that's the contrite heart. We studied that last week uh, in the sermon. Uh, the Lord looks on that one who says, I hate sin, and recognizes that as godly sorrow or repentance, and not just the worldly sorrow or repentance, which forces us to think through, what do I really mean when I say I'm sorry for my sin? Uh, and Is it worldly or godly sorrow? Is it true repentance? Um, that's why so much of the other scripture is helpful, like the language of Proverbs or Psalms, if I regard iniquity. Well, that, that's a pretty significant word that makes us think through uh, what I'm thinking about my sin when I'm confessing it. Um, because we looked at a lot of ways there a couple chapters back on how we can kind of fudge on our confessing and acknowledging our sin. Um, and it seems like the scripture is not giving us any place to have any excuse, any justification, uh, any tolerance for our sin. Rather, it's saying it's got to be pushed into the light uh, and no darkness at all. So obviously, the word is sanctifying. Prayer can fan this flame of sanctification and change. Uh, what else? Yeah. Worship, just focusing on God and who he is, and with gratitude for all he has done, I off of self and completely on God and worship and praise. The, the author camps out on, on that very word, worship. He says, worship isn't just an affirmation that God is good. It's an affirmation that God is better. It's James 1. Every good gift comes down from the Father above. And after hearing that, then we're told, listen, <laughs> there's a reason why you can say no to being drawn away by this lust and enticed. Because you can stop and in faith and in worship say, God is better. God promises better. God's way is better. And yes, we're not wrong to worship and say God is good, mind you. He's not saying that. But he's saying in this battle of sanctification, yes, we can worship and say God is good on Sunday, but then we look and during the week we're tempted and we think, oh, that looks really good, and we do that. And now the battle's on. Is God better than that? And true worship is indeed that affirmation that God is better. He goes on to say we must call each other to the worship of God and away from the worship of other gods. We cannot be like all the kings of 1st, 2nd Kings and Chronicles who they, they walked in the ways of the Lord uh, or in the ways of their father David, but they didn't take down all the groves. We have to call each other to the worship of God, yes, but away from the worship of other gods. They, they, that should go together, but it doesn't often in our minds. So Sunday can be a, a rich experience of gathered worship, and yet Sunday night and Monday can be, you know, really low times of compromise and sin. 
uh, and we're not recognizing that to come and to worship God is to say, I don't want to worship anything else. Just that study of worship alone, it, it brings substance to what Paul referenced from Isaiah, the, the two cisterns, the, the, the broken cistern and crummy water and, and the pure fountain of living water. There, there's a reason that word worship, you know, is used today. It, it expresses a value, a desire, something I want. So worship is, is a huge factor in, in this Fanning of the flame in the heart for change. A heart of repentance and faith is, is helped by worship. Uh, we have more to talk about. You can think some more there. We'll finish this up next week. Uh, as we close, just remember uh, what the author was getting at there with the sowing and reaping, that sanctification is a harvest. It's not just going to happen uh, without anything on our part, um, we're to sow to the Spirit so that we can reap of the Spirit all that that is promised in the life of Christ. Heavenly Father, uh, make us busy farmers this week as we're planting the, the seeds of spirituality. Uh, help us to understand uh, this process of change in this passage from Galatians 6 and sowing and reaping. Uh, bring us a harvest of holiness that comes because we've given attention to your word, uh, to your spirit. Uh, we've sought to commune with you in prayer. We've sought to extol your majesty and your, your worth-ship. Even in this hour to come, would you use this season of worship to equip us for spiritual warfare against all the wiles of our enemy, the devil. Uh, give us hope and help through the name of Jesus by which we pray. Amen.